So now we are going to have um, a panel discussion, which is uh, very interesting uh, and very interesting format. So the panel discussion is going to have tech for good, build the world you want to live in as the topic. And the uh, two hosts are uh, Alexis and Romain. And I'm going to hand over to them. We're going to have um, we're going to have a few short talks. So I'm going to play uh, video J here uh, and then switch between the different talks. So I hope I get everything right. <laughs> um, let's see how this goes. So off you go. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're very excited to have you here for a, a kind of a special session uh, during the Euro Python. Uh, my name is Romain from Numberly. And at Numberly, Python is basically at the heart of, everything, of uh, our very own little tech world. And we're very proud to stand by the community, um, and this great community uh, around Python and uh, EuroPython that, that we're part of. Uh, at Numberly, we've been sponsoring EuroPython every year since 2014. And since we've been offered this sponsor talk, we thought about doing something a, a bit different this year. So it's a sponsor talk, but rather than talking about us, Numberly, the people, the technology, the company, and what we do, we thought about talking instead of we uh, talking about a nonprofit organization and uh, end over the stage to the, those uh, nonprofit organizations that we work with uh, through our foundation. Our foundation is called Mille Merci Impacts, and it works with the three speakers that we we're gonna have and you're gonna hear from. Uh, those speakers are connected together by the daily engagement in making use of technology for causes uh, that go beyond our usual boundaries, meaning that it goes a little bit uh, outside of what we used to do with the, uh, our techni technical skills. And that's a very interesting topic, I think. Uh, I think we, we think at Numberly that it's going to resonate very well with the, the diversity of the, the Python community. Uh, it's a really open-minded community uh, that is already, already always open to uh, be challenged and be open uh, to uh, new, new point of views and experiences. Uh, so first of all, we're going to have Margot from Latitude, who's going to talk about the various ways we can use technology for greater good, for the common good, sorry. Uh, second, we're going to have Brio from Confedix, who's going to share about his experience teaching code to inmates to help them rehabilitate. And we're going to have a, a quick, uh, uh, return of experience, let's say, uh, by Sebastian uh, from uh, from Numberly, who actually uh, worked with Code Phoenix. Um, last, we're going to talk about decoders. Unfortunately, Swat cannot be with us uh, today, but Alex is going to jump in and uh, and talk about uh, this organization that work with to to help uh, to help um, women, uh, especially from disadvantaged neighborhoods, to get into tech uh, in the first place and manage to get uh, tech uh, tech jobs. All right, so. Without further ado, let's hand it over to Margot from Latin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Margot. I work at Latitude, which is a um, four years old NGO that's working in the tech for good sector. At Latitude, we'd rather call this uh, a committed and responsible tech rather than tech for good, but I'll get to that in a second. Just to start on before, I wanted to say a big thank you to Numberly for having us and for offering the, us the chance to give a talk at the EuroPython to spread the word that um, tech and social innovation are just two sides of the same coin. So who are we at Latitude? We define ourselves as a community of tech for good enthusiasts. So we are uh, people working in the tech sector and trying to uh, promote a committed and responsible technology. Um, so what do we mean by that? Uh, first of what's a committed technology? I'm just going to start off with a few examples of what do we mean by that. Um, one example is a NGO that we work with that is Emmaus, which is a global charity working to end uh, homelessness. We worked with them on a data science project. And one of the goals was to develop a pricing algorithm recommendation to help the companions that are working at Emmaus and that get to um, collect the that get to collect uh, all the items that have been donated to Emmaus. And then after they put that on the e-commerce website, and so we worked with them to develop a algorithm of pricing recommendation. 
A second example of what would be a committed technology is a mobile app this time that we worked on with an association called Ares, which also works on um, the inclusion sector. They had an issue because they had people that were performing security audits in their um, in their companies and they were not able to do it on their own because they did not speak French, they couldn't understand uh, the paperwork and we worked with them to develop a mobile app that would enable them to run the security audits in full autonomy. So that's another example for us of how you can link um, a social answer, a, I mean an answer to a social issue and at the same time a, a technological breakthrough. So with that being said, there's much more examples of what's a committed technology. But for us, for, for instance, if I just want to draw a bit on another one, um, there's technologies that have been developed to prevent wildfire through image recognition. So in each topic and in each area of the um, social and environmental issues that we are facing right now, technology can actually make a change and help us solve these issues. So that's one side of what I'm talking about. But on the other side, uh, technology still have a tremendous impact on environment and on society. So it's interesting to develop committed technologies. It's also interesting to think about the responsible coin of technology. We can go on to the next slide, please. Um, yet what we see today is that 15% of the people in France that are aged 15 or more have not used the internet this year. Uh, another uh, data that is striking is that 80% of adults now spend three hours or more in front of a screen each day outside of their professional activity, uh, which used to be 47% in 2013 when they first conducted the study, in 2008, sorry, when they first conducted the story, which is a massive surge. Uh, and what we believe at Let's Do is that we also have to work on uh, this side of technology. And the great news is that us as tech actors, we can actually work on this. So if we go on to the next slide, there's a bunch of organizations trying to create more responsible technologies. And I'm going to give a few examples here as well. Uh, one of them is Emmaüs Connect, which is an NGO working to help people with digital inclusion. So if we take the example of Evelyn, she decided not to use the internet 20 years ago, and now she's been unable to um, access government services in, well, for, for instance, to pay her taxes, to get health insurance, those things have been taken away from her because she's unable to use those um, to, to use the technologies and to use the websites on which those are designed. So this NGO, MAS Connect, worked with her and they're helping all of these people to acquire the minimum uh, digital skills in order to use them. So that's one example of an organization working on the topic of digital inclusion. Another one that we have right here is Samplon. That organization is working on um, building a more diverse tech and having more diversity in uh, the conceptors of technology. So they offer free training for uh, people from disadvantaged background to get into the tech industry. And that's exactly what happened to Sebouge, who arrived in France in 2014 with the refugee status. And uh, he was trained by Saint-Plon freely to uh, become a web developer. And now he's part of uh, the tech community. And then we can go into the next slide again. So what we mean by responsible technology, it's a technology that is able to control the social and environmental externalities of technology. And at least we really try to work at um, conducting our jobs more ethically. So not only using technology for the common good, but also how do we create those technologies and how do we make them more ethical? Um, and with that being said, you might wonder now, what do we actually do at Attitude? Uh, we have three ma uh, major programs. The first one is that we're running a teaching program in um, computer science schools and engineering schools. We're enable st enabling students to work on tech projects for charities, for social organizations. Um, the second program that we have is a program to help companies create a tech for good culture within their companies and try to um, uh, apply all of those responsible ways of doing tech uh, in their work and in their everyday jobs. 
and a few data points to finish on. Uh, so far now we've been training about 6,000 students uh, every year with our program. We have more than 3,000 people that joined our community, uh, 20 schools and uh, about 15 tech companies. But we're hoping that we're gonna go a bit more and that uh, more and more companies are gonna join the community and uh, the Tech for Good movement. And the last thing that I want to finish off with today is that if you guys are interested in that, if you want to understand all of the, we can go on to the next slide. If you want to understand the, what are today the major tech issues or what are the links between tech and all of the social and environmental challenges we're facing today. And if you want to act on those with your technical skills, you can join our community. Right now, I'm very sorry because it's all in French. Uh, but we're going to get our new website that's going to come out, I think, normally in September. So everything will, will be available in English. Um, well, thank you very much. And now I'm going to head off the stage to Brieux, uh, who's actually going to talk about an example of what we call a committed technology. And just fun fact to finish on, we worked on a project with Code Phoenix. So some of our students from our program have worked on a project for Code Phoenix, but I'll let Brieu uh, explain that to you much better. Uh, thank you, Margot, and uh, thank you also to, to Numberly for letting me speak during this event. Um, so my name is uh, Brieu Lebars. I'm uh, here to talk to you about Code Phoenix, which is a NGO that I co-founded uh, four years ago, and I, I uh, I'm a director of this NGO right now. Uh, we deal with the professional reintegration of those released from prison. So um, first of all, since I'm not sure you know about much about the French prison systems, maybe a few words of context. Um, the prison system in France, as in many, as in many other co countries, does not work exactly the way it's supposed to. Uh, indeed, According to our laws, uh, prison uh, uh, have two purposes. To temp first, to temporarily uh, remove people who are dangerous to others or to society, but also uh, to reintegrate them uh, so that they do not come back to prison. And uh, in France, with more than 60% recidivism with, within five years of release, it's tough to say that it works perfectly. Uh, it has become a vicious circle from which it is difficult to uh, to break out. Uh, that leads to a logical problem, which is uh, chronic prison overcrowding. Uh, in France, in in uh, some prison, you can find three people living in nine square meter. We are often um, shown as one of the bad students in in Europe for that. Uh, around 1,000 people sleep uh, on the mattress laid right on the floor. So uh, it is difficult to, to uh, after such a time in prison, uh, in these conditions, to reintegrate easily society. And moreover, it takes a lot of aspects uh, to reintegrate uh, fully society. It takes to have a roof, uh, to have strong family ties or to, to rebuild them. Uh, to have access to healthcare, to have a, a stable job, and uh, we decided to work on that on that last aspect uh, to for uh, having a stable job when uh, when we go out of uh, prison. Um, and for now, we uh, we found we found out four years ago that uh, not a lot is being done yet uh, for this aspect. Uh, indeed, uh, less than 20% of, of inmates have access to vocational training. Um, and if they have, or if they have access to a job, they don't, they don't really have much choice about uh, which uh, training we, they can choose. Uh, it's only uh, for branches with uh, little added value on, and not necessarily in high demand uh, on the labor markets. Uh, and in the same time, in parallel to that, uh, we can observe, and I'm, I'm sure you you already all have, that there is a lack of developers on the job market, which has led to, to change a little bit the power relationship between employers and job seekers. And uh, at Code Phoenix, it's, it's exactly what we want to do. We want to use that change to help inmates break the vicious circle of uh, recidivism. 
but um, since I've said that, uh, how can we make uh, people from inmates uh, to web developers outside? Uh, we we have built a, a program uh, that uh, is based on three pillars. Um, one, the first one is vocational training. Uh, second one is work experience, and then support and counsel. So first, we select a group of eight people uh, that will be trained in prison uh, as web integrators during six months. Uh, they learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, or tools like Bootstrap or Git. Once they are trained, uh, we hire them in our web agency, in, still inside the prison, uh, for the remaining of their sentence um and so they can work uh, on um, on real and concrete uh, missions for clients on real websites that we will be able to show to future recruiters uh, uh, because uh, web development is all about uh, professional experience more than um, a curriculum uh, moreover, it enables us to go further in the training and teach them about, for instance, JavaScript uh, frameworks like uh, Vue.js or React. So in parallel to, to the training and the time in the web agency, we also prepare them for their job search and to, we prepare them also to the professional uh, reintegration. So we work on their resume, we work, we do mock interviews. Um, and moreover, we also bring professional developers in prison to meet them, speak with them, have peer programming sessions and so on, so that they can demystify a little bit the um, digital world. Uh, finally, when they are released, uh, we offer to help them find uh, a job uh, if they want to continue in this branch. Uh, that being said, setting up uh, such a program, as you may wonder, uh, in prison, in a prison environment is not that easy. And uh, we face a lot of constraints. Uh, and uh, to, to conclude this presentation, uh, I talk to you about three, the, the, the three main constraints we face every day. Um, the first one, and maybe the, the most important one for us, is that we can't have access to internet in prison. It's completely forbidden in France. So we teach the web without the web. Uh, the famous Google is your friend does not apply to our learners. Uh, that means that they don't have access to code samples, to uh, Stack Overflow, to tutorials, etc. So they, they, they won't have the same uh, autonomy that uh, every other learner uh, around the world. Um, we did set up an intranet so that the people that participate to the program can uh, have access to the resources we, we put on it uh, and work together on a project using a uh, GitLab. But uh, it's never enough. It's never like the web. So we have to create uh, every time more and more resources. And it, this takes time. And uh, we are always looking for help to uh, to create a collection of code, code samples, collection of code animations, and so on. Uh, the second uh, uh, issue we face a lot is that uh, our learners, uh, even trained, even after a long time with us, uh, still fight against a persistent imposter syndrome. Um, because the digital sector for them seems way out of reach. And uh, this is why we try to bring as many uh, web professionals inside of prisons to, to talk to them and to uh, desacralize and demystify the digital sector for learners and so that they can think themselves themselves really as web developers and not uh, just as, for, as a hobby. Um, uh, last but not least, the, the web agency that we have is really cru crucial and central to our program. Uh, it provides new job opportunities in prison. 
it allows us to offer uh, continuous training to our learners to pay them to accompany them to to have a link to them for a long time and despite the lack uh, the fact that the lack of internet access prevents us from being as fast as our competitors or the fact that our developers are junior, juniors we managed to already worked on more than 10 websites um, the latest one being for, for the French Ministry of Justice uh, and we are always looking for new clients uh, because our learners are always uh, demanding new projects they are always really happy to to find out about, about new websites and um, to imagine how they can work on it so if you need a web agency and you want to to help us participate to the professional reintegrations of uh, inmates uh, don't hesitate to to give us a call and to visit our, our website um so now now that i said everything uh, i uh, hand over to to sebastian da, who who has come with us uh, in prison as a volunteer uh, and uh, he, i think he'll give you a little bit of uh, of uh, feedback. Yes, thank you so much, Brieux. Uh First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity and for everything that you're doing. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce myself and then uh, give you some feedback about my uh, experience in Code Phoenix. So I'm Sébastien. Uh, I'm a French data engineer at Numberly. I work uh, full remote from uh, Taiwan, so good evening. <laughs> Um, and I was a, a speaker once uh, for Code Phoenix uh, as a CSS instructor. Um, so it's very intimidating to think that you're going to go to prison and you're going to teach inmates to do CSS. But uh, I have to say the reality was completely, uh, completely different from anything I could have expected. Um, Sure, you go into prison, it's a big building, there's lots of gates, but once you get in there uh, and you meet the inmates, it's just a group of eight really, really, really sweet middle-aged men. Uh, they're so happy that you're there. Uh, I came in, they gave me tea. They were really, really, really sweet. I, I guess um, they must be super grateful that people take from their time to go all the way out into uh, the suburbs, into the, the prison and take their time to, to teach them. But for me, it was just a very positive experience. And uh, it always feels really great to uh, be able to give back, especially to people who you know might have made a mistake and just want to uh, get a chance to redeem their, themselves through tech. Uh, it was my uh, privilege to be able to do that. So uh, thank you very much, Brieux. And uh, you know, thank you, Numberly, for giving me this chance, because uh, not every company, I suppose, uh, lets you take part of your work time and you know go do something like this. But so overall, yeah, a really positive experience. Um, if you want to talk to me or ask me more questions about it, you can uh, find me on the Wonder Me in the little uh, numberly box. Um, uh, yeah, that's it for me. I'll be giving a, giving the mic back to Alexi. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, and uh, hi everyone. So I'm going to jump in at the place of uh, Swad, um, who, who couldn't make it, unfortunately, for personal reasons. Um, so I'm going to try my best to present you uh, uh, Decoders, which is the name of our uh, uh, nonprofit organization. Um, so Decoders' uh, mission is to help uh, women uh, from um, from um, um, from disadvantages, uh, sorry, uh, neighborhoods uh, get a start in the tech industry, and they do this by uh, coaching them and teaching them how to code. So if we go uh, on the on the next slide, yeah. Um, so what they are doing is to work on, crea on creating a positive impact uh, and to shed a light on some of the people, especially women, uh, that's even worse, uh, from disadvantages uh, neighborhoods uh, into the tech industry. Uh, they have uh, some numbers that are not so not so nice to 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 see uh, to be honest when 
you are uh, you are as privileged as we can be uh, in 10 years uh, only two points increase in uh, uh, in the women in the science uh, in IT globally it's um, it's uh, not very much um, so I think um, any kind of engagement like uh, decoders uh, can do make a difference actually uh, the unemployment as well is uh, is uh, is uh, twice as high uh, for this population that it is for the rest of the territory. So the ground um, and the trend uh, is uh, definitely needs uh, needs more help and more energy into it. Um, so how do they do this? Uh, uh, on the next uh, slide, um, they want. Just like Brieux uh, uh, said, there are, we have a lack of developers, of people capable of, uh, of doing tech. Um, so there's, that means also that uh, on the bright side, there are opportunities, uh, actually. Um, so, but there are still those women uh, who are hard to reach. Uh, and uh, when you see that, yeah, only 30% of women in the tech industry, it's not it's not that much. Uh, if you then add uh, that 8% uh, are living in the priority areas are actually trained in technology, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a lot of things that we can uh, in, can improve, and it's also a lot of opportunities. So for this, uh, Decoders has uh, have put up three programs um, that we can see uh, on the next slide. So the first one uh, is called uh, Tech Dalid. Um, I like I like this put of words. Uh, it's a one week action. So it's a short thing to just. Um, prove, uh, I guess, to some of, of the women uh, over there that it, it can be done. Uh, so, hey, like an eye opener, right? Um, in one week, I'm going to show you what it is, what you can do, uh, and and how you can engage into a, a, a longer uh, a longer training and break the ice so that you can you can you can go on. Uh, the second one then is Tech Da Power. Uh, which is a, a real professional training program. It's a one-year course. So this one is more intensive. It has uh, uh, tech professionals participating, uh, internships, uh, uh, interviews, uh, trainings, boot camps, tests, etc., etc. Everything you need to actually become a, a, a professional developer. And then there's also how you accompany uh the people that uh, you are uh, you you've worked for um and work with sorry um and it's the take that rise for the guiding side uh, so it's uh, empowerment uh, uh, working on how you can increase and improve your professional confidence uh, uh or, or or the imposter syndrome like you said uh, as well uh, which is uh, which is a uh, always pretty high uh, when you were not um, trained or, 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 or socially prepared uh, for, for this kind of, uh, of job. Uh, it, it's something that uh, you have to put energy in to, to get through. And um, it's great because uh, I know that um, um, we have, uh, at Novali, we have been uh, uh, privileged to host one of those uh, those sessions, so we 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 just uh, landed our the, some space uh, and decoders came and with uh, with uh, with all the participants uh, to to spend uh, some time uh, at Numberly and they could have a session with uh, with everything they needed. So that's also another way we support uh, this kind of uh, organization. And the feedback is is uh, is pretty great. So we are very uh, we are very glad that uh, it's going on uh, good. And I think the last slide has uh, some nice uh, numbers um, because uh, when you put all this energy, you are always happy to have um, some uh, some real and concrete uh, results. And uh, we can we can fairly say that decoders have uh, some nice uh, nice numbers. Uh, so about job offerings, 
and their capacity at acquiring and feeling that they they have technical skills. Uh, obviously, the boost of income in, in, in our field that is uh, better, I, I guess, than the, 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 the typical jobs uh, that they they could turn to. Um, um and uh, and and the average salary is uh, is is pretty good for for a junior so thank you and congratulations to swad and all the people uh, uh, working at decoders uh, they are making a difference daily uh, uh, latitude ev evidently as well uh, brio and code phoenix as well all those uh, organizations are making a tremendous uh, work and having an impact is uh, outside of the usual tech for tech and i think uh, and i encourage also a lot of other companies to join this and to support uh, all, all all these actions every day I, and i'm handing over the mic to roma thank you thanks everyone um, i just want to end up with two uh, side notes and that are still uh, still very important before we go into the Q&A. Um, as Alexi talked about uh, with uh, with SWAT uh, slides, there's an emphasis that needs to be made, that needs to be made and uh, some effort needs to be to be made also on the gender equity in tech in general. And um, in that uh, around that subject, uh, we had uh, recently a webinar at Numberly with Naomi. If you remember Naomi, I think she last year during last year's edition of the Europython, she had a she had a talk about gender equity, and we we had the chance to have her again at Numberly uh, with uh, Aurélie Jean uh, and uh, François Henri Pinot uh, during a webinar last March uh, regarding that uh, very this very on topic. So. There's a lot to be done, and uh, there are some great information there uh, in that webinar. So if you got a, you got a time and, and and you want to, uh, you can have a look. Uh, the last thing before going to the Q and A is we would like to thank uh, take this opportunity just a sec to uh, thank the Python uh, organ uh, organizer uh, and all the volunteers uh, that are doing an awesome job, and they're very they've been very accommodating to us uh, with this uh, this session that is a bit uh, a bit different than the others, uh, especially with all the 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 speakers and everything. So thanks again uh, uh, to everyone at, at your Python. Uh, the, the conference this year is awesome as always. So thank you. Thank you, everyone involved. I guess we can move on to the Q&A now. OK, Romain. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a bit challenging. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing this VJ thing. So <laughs> please bear with me. A bit. I, <laughs> I'm going to try to to put you all up on the screen now. Let me try that like this, and then we do have uh, two qu two questions here. So, actually, I think they're they're both uh, both for for Brio. Um, so the first one is: Did you get much enthusiasm from employers? Imagine some employers might be prejudiced against ex-offenders. Um. Well, we we're still a very young organization. We've been uh, training people only for two years in prisons yet, uh, so we don't have much uh, numbers to prove that uh, the, the training and an experience in web development is uh, enough to counterbalance the um, uh, the weight of. Uh, of an offense that you committed uh, uh, at any point in, in your life. That's a bet we are making with uh, with our learners for now. Uh, we're still waiting for the our first people to come out and pre of prison and wanting to to go back uh, to to go to to the digital branch to to prove that it works. Okay, thank you. So uh, there's a second question. I'm going to put that on right away as well. So uh, this is also related to the uh, uh, prisoners. And conversely, how do you how do you avoid employers who want to exploit these people? So, uh, so I, I, I think this is about um, working in prison that is uh, can be uh, associated with exploitation. Uh, so uh, our, our customers and uh, 
employers don't employ uh, our learners in prison. This, uh, we employ the, the, the people we work with in, for, in prison, so we fix the rule and we're trying to, to be above the, the, the standard in prison for now. Um, and uh, outside of the prison, it's not supposed to happen because they are uh, protected by the, um, the work uh, rights in France, so, uh, which is not the case in prison. But in prison, we are the, only, the sole employer of our learners. Okay, thank you. So let's have another question, this time to Code Phoenix. Uh, do you also teach technology in women? Uh, prisons. Ah, there's women prisons, okay, so, specific prisons for women, yeah. Um, not yet, um, because uh, it's not easy to find women in prison. There are really uh, not a lot of them in prison, fortunately for them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the um, only three percent of the general uh, inmates population are women in France, uh, and I guess it's about the same rates in other countries, uh, which asks the question why, and uh, we we will never know exactly. Mostly and uh, really, uh, surely it's about education, but. Uh, uh, so in France, there are only two prisons that are only for women. Uh, so it's not that easy to to find them near where I live. <laughs> okay. But it's something we want to do in the future. Okay, great. So, uh, well, I have yet another question for for Prior. Sorry about that. Um, do you know if any government started similar programs? for prisoners? Um, so I know that uh, before us, uh, um, the, f the, first, um, the first one that took action uh, and, and developed the program uh, for inmates to, to learn web development is the United States. Uh, they, they, they started uh, their program in uh, 2013, I believe. Um, I'm not sure if they also have a web agency, but they start. They are uh, the program is called the Last Mile. If you want to check, and uh, they are starting to have a really good result and really good uh, and really encouraging results. Of course, it's not the same environment, uh, work uh, environment as in France, but we, it's uh, it gives us courage to continue. And in Europe, we we were the second ones after England, uh, we which uh, uh, started a program in 2016 that's called uh, Code 4000. Okay, interesting. Uh, we had a keynote uh, last year at EuroPython by Jessica McKellar, and uh, she is uh, or she was heading uh, the Python in Prison program there and uh, basically helped the, um, you know, talked about how open source can change a criminal justice system. Um, another question. So, uh, Descodeus looks amazing. Is there anything similar in English? In, well, UK English. I guess US English. English is fine as well. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll relay, if you want to get the answer, please relay it in, uh, in, in, uh, in the channel so we can pick it up and we'll make sure to forward it to, to some people at Decoders who know more about their, their similar environments. I, I don't know, I'm sorry. Okay, excellent. And uh, final question. Actually, there's one, one of the, oops, yeah, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, there's a, an organization called TechFugees. So they run in France, but not only, they also run in England, in Italy, in Greece, and they have a really similar program to Decodus. It's, it's a, I mean, it's way smaller, but they just started a program. So they're teaching refugee women uh, how to learn how to code and get into the tech sector. And they're also helping on the uh, employment section. 
So really similar to, to Decodus. There's probably way more, so it's still really good to ask uh, Sweat the question. What did you say they were called? It's called Tech Fugees. Tech Fugees, yeah. Um, I, actually, I, I think it would be good uh, after the talk if you'd go to the breakout room knee and then perhaps answer some uh, additional questions people might have after this, this last question. Maybe you can also share some extra resources with them. Um, so the last question is, are you selective about which inmates women get the opportunity to learn or do you try to stay as inclusive as possible? So to, uh, for the for Code Phoenix, we to select the people who are going to participate to the program, we uh, make sure they they know how to use a computer. That's what the, that's the minimum we ask, uh, because that's not uh, the case for everyone in prison. There is a, a really um, a lot of people that never used uh, a computer or very. Uh, very few. I learned. I, I taught people how to do uh, uppercase uh, at one point. Um, so we we want them to to know how to use a basic computer, and afterwards we we have a twenty minutes talk with them to understand their motivation, and that's the key to to the selection. Okay. Thank you. Anyone for for decoders? I don't know. I guess that's something similar, but I, I can't, I don't know. Okay, great. So thank you very much for for the session. I think that was a, a very nice overview of the this different NGOs that you're working with, and uh, thanks to all the NGO representatives coming here and and sharing their their thoughts and insights. Um, thanks to Numberly for you know making this possible <laughs> and sponsoring us. Um, Right, if there are any more questions, then please go to the breakout room three, the knee room, and then you can uh, reach out to Number Lee and all the NGOs there as well. Okay, we're gonna have a coffee break now. See you in a bit, bye-bye.